Welcome everyone to the Pennsylvania Historical Association's evening webinar on uh, early career historian experiences working through the pandemic. Our conversation tonight will touch on transitioning to virtual exhibits, uh, building digital archives and accessing archives through a pandemic, and of course the labor involved for academics pivoting from traditional classroom instruction to online formats with very short notice and sometimes mid-semester. A few courtesies before we get into the moderated discussion. Audience members, welcome. We're so glad you're here. If you have questions for the first half hour, please do drop those into the chat. Uh, and then about a half hour in, uh, we will pivot to the audience questions. If we can't get through all of them or you have burning questions after the webinar, I'll have my email in the chat at that time and feel free to reach out to me. We'll do our best to answer whatever questions we can. I'm Jake Wolf, the web and social media editor for the Pennsylvania Historical Association. Uh, and I'll be moderating tonight's conversation. I'm joined by three panelists. Ian Gavigan, a third year PhD student at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. He researches social movements, labor and the state. Uh, in 2018, he was a scholar in residence with the Pennsylvania State Archives and through the PHA. And he worked with never, never before studied collections of Reading's weekly labor newspaper, The Labor Advocate, uh, with pieces you know, published through the 30s. Uh, Tyler Stump is an archivist with the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Association working at the State Archives in Harrisburg. He trained in American history and library science at the University of Maryland worked previously at the Smithsonian, and his first article was published in the spring issue 2021 of Pennsylvania History. So we were really excited to see that. And our third panelist is uh, Rachel Yerger. She works as a museum curator for a PHMC as well, and she manages collections held at historic sites throughout the state. Uh, she's worked with the National Park Service before at Valley Forge and completed her master's in history from Villanova University. So. All three, welcome. We're so glad you can join us. Uh, and the Pennsylvania Historical Association uh, appreciates young scholars and young public historians sharing their expertise. Uh, their, the future of the profession is in the early career folks. And we are addressing as a profession and field some pretty big questions before the pandemic through and looking forward. So without getting in too many of those giant questions. I'd love to start our conversation off with the same question to everyone, to share a little bit about how your day to day as a researcher, an archivist, a museum curator had shifted through the pandemic and how your organizations as well had to shift pretty quickly. Uh, Ian, I, I know from academic Twitter that graduate workers had to adjust very quickly. Uh, if you wouldn't mind starting, we'd love to learn from you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you, PHA, for hosting us. I'm excited to be on this panel. Um, I uh, I had the um, the fortune and misfortune of um, going becoming ABD the basically the week uh, everything shut down. Um, so I defended a dissertation proposal that said, "Oh, I was going to go to all these archives in four states over twelve months." And, uh, and then I would go write it all up. Well, uh, it became very clear very quickly that that was not going to happen. Um, so on my research side, fortunately, I um, had a fellowship, was in fellowship that year, um, and wasn't um, required to take on the enormous new uh, workloads that many of my colleagues and comrades had to take on in the transition to um, to digital teaching and digital learning. Um, so many of them had to put in well over the contractual limit of hours uh, to not only get their own classes online, but also to get full-time faculty and, and um, more seasoned members of, of the faculty uh, transitioned um, to make sure our departments were functioning um, and to support undergrads as they also went through a kind of traumatic move um, and in a really horrible moment. So um, I had, through my uh, unit organizing, have been exposed to a lot of those those challenges and, and problems. But thankfully, uh, in my in my own work, I was able to focus on how do I pivot my dissertation research um, when 
all of my sources are all of my news sources are closed off to me. So I, um, you know, in, uh, I already said this to, to the co-panelists, but my dissertation pretty quickly became a newspapers.com dissertation. I uh, and uh, Hathi Trust and um, Google Books uh, and all of the way Internet Archive, all of the kind of websites, some more legitimate than others, where you could piece together information, um, never quite perfect. And uh, interestingly, though, in that process, though, I basically had to accept that I was abandoning my full blown research agenda, because there's no way that uh, with funding packages, how they are, uh, I was going to come out of a year and a half to two years of, of archive closures able to complete that full 12 to 14 month research plan. I was actually able to find new collections of research through uh, through digital archives, recently some recently digitized, some probably more longstanding, that provided different insights into my project. I work on the history of the American Socialist Movement with an emphasis on Pennsylvania, and I was able to discover uh, records I frankly didn't know existed um, that I like, that I knew had existed but didn't didn't know where I could find them. Um, and uh, not having access to the records I thought I'd have access to pushed me to work really hard. And it actually changed um, the structure and, and the kind of focus of the first half of my dissertation, which I'm now really excited about, um, despite it being quite different from, from how I planned. So that's not to say I think COVID has been good for me, my dissertation or the historical profession, but I think, um, I think my story is not also not unique. Uh, I know plenty of, of early career graduate students um, who have faced the same question, my program and others. And it's been interesting and sometimes exciting to be able to, um, with the help of digital archivists um, and, uh, and, and librarians and, and all these great professionals who are, who are making all these um, resources accessible, um, you know, we, we've been able to, to, to make something of it. So that's, um, I'll, I'll leave it at there for now. Thanks, Ian. I know I've loved, at least from the virtual and seeing all the different story maps and exhibits using records that were already digitized, were very quickly digitized. It's been enjoyable to learn from some of that public facing stuff as well. Uh, Rachel, you're a curator with the Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission. How had the pandemic forced or encouraged to adapt quickly to those digital formats? Yeah, um, a lot of what Ian said made me feel like so excited about some of the work that we're doing. So thank you. And I'm glad that it's, uh, I hope that other people are finding it useful as well. Um, so my job, I'm a history curator. I is a little different than a lot of the curators I work with. I um, travel a lot. I'm responsible for multiple sites across the state. So I travel a lot um, to work with collections um, everywhere from, you know, down towards Philly up towards Erie. Um, so once the pandemic hit, obviously travel was shut down. And so a lot of my hands-on projects were um, pushed to the side. And luckily um, the PHMC had just transitioned to a web-based collections management system. So that meant that I could, as long as I had internet access, I could access my collections records. Um, and additionally, um, our collections management system, um, which is called Argus.net, um, has a public portal, which allows us to publish our collections database online. So that's what a lot of our work went to. I went towards getting photos of objects up online, worked towards getting researching collections so we could get the information um, out into the public for people to use for, for projects like that. Um, so the timing really kind of worked out. I, you know, I don't want to put a positive spin on the pandemic, but it really, um, we were kind of in a good space for us to, to shift back to remote work. Um, so even though people couldn't come to our museums, we were still had um, a way for people to um, access the objects. Thank you, Rachel. Tyler, how about in Harrisburg? Uh, how was your experience? Um, yeah, it's definitely been kind of a little bit of what Rachel and Ian have both talked about. Um, I'm still working from home, so I get into the state archives in Harrisburg maybe once every couple of weeks just for a day or two, but it's not a lot. So um, basically everything's been done from home that I can do on my laptop. Uh, and my normal day-to-day -day work is I'm an acquisitions archivist here at the archives. So 
most of my time is spent kind of like Rachel, I travel around the state, but it's really, I'm going to different government offices and other places, um, reviewing historical or potentially historical records that are stored in different places uh, and determining if we want to transfer them to the archives where we can preserve and provide access to them. And since we've had, you know, the governor's office hasn't allowed us to travel since March of last year. Um, so that has totally had to stop. And I've had to field a lot of calls where um, people are calling me because a lot of people during pandemic, a lot of bosses, they said, oh, it's a good opportunity uh, to clean out our office. And they've dug up a lot of old records and old materials that nobody knew were in the back corner or the attic, wherever else. Um, so I'm getting a lot of calls. We've found this stuff. What do we do with it? And normally I'd say, well, this is great. I'll be right over. I'll pick it up and take it back to Harrisburg. Uh, but I can't do that now. And uh, that's been a little frustrating. Um, and so I've had to kind of pivot to, you know, teaching or training or just conveying to people um, how to kind of take care of stuff and just temporarily preserve it on their own until I can get to it. So kind of just keeping things stable, I guess. Um, so that's kind of ended and we've had to just deal with that as best we can. Although I think I have like 15 different trips ready to go as soon as our travel ban is lifted. So I'll be very busy then. Um, but in my day to day for me, since I'm not working on that, uh, I'm spending a lot of time either doing trainings or outreach or things like that, where I'm communicating with other folks uh, remotely and just talking about um, archives, best practices um, for government staff, you know, the requirements of what records you have to keep or what records are archival and how do they get sent to us at the right time and things like that. Um, so a lot of sort of training and communicating with people about archives. Um, and about kind of the, the nuts and bolts so that later on the records that are important get preserved and people will have them. Um, we've done a little bit of collecting with digital record and I've definitely been involved with that, although a lot of those records are much newer and it's not quite time for them to come to the archives yet because people are still using them. Uh, we usually wait until records are kind of inactive or no longer in use before they come over to us. Um, but we're preparing for that. So we're trying to educate people what are the things that even though you might have just create, sent this email or created this document, you need to think about its historical significance and relevance and the fact that somebody is going to need that someday in the future, maybe after we're all long gone, but it needs to be you know, taken care of now. Um, so just trying to educate people about what's important, what do we think about. Um, a lot of the stuff is common sense, but you just might not think of it because you have a lot of other things going on. Um, so just trying to raise awareness. And I think that's definitely been easier during the pandemic because it's easier to reach people. Um, everyone can attend a Zoom webinar now. You know, everyone, I can communicate with them and get to them where before it was like, well, we've got a schedule time when I can come out and see you in person. And that was a little trickier. So um, I think that's been maybe a benefit. I, it's just something different that I haven't done before, but that's definitely been the shift for me. The, the digital records are really interesting to me. I, I studied uh, neighborhood activism around university campus expansions, pretty contemporary work in my master's. And some of the most interesting sources I found were YouTube videos that activists were posting, recording public meetings, things that weren't happening on a, like a, a, a formal record. And through some of these informal virtual channels, important moments were getting documented. Has the pandemic accelerated then how archives are trying to record some of that digital stuff and avoid digital decay? Uh, I guess I can answer that first, just because I'm an archivist. That's a good question. Um, I think it's definitely made people think more about what records are out there, where before, like you said, like there have always been public meetings or just meetings in general, but now it's so easy to record them. You know, before people had conversations all the time, but now it's so easy to capture them online, whether it's in social media or email or some other format. I think right now, just a lot of the things that we've always had are being, they're becoming available in new formats. And so that creates new opportunities to um, capture them. But I, I think from an archivist perspective, it's a lot easier to capture or create these records and preservation is definitely another thing, Jake, like you talked about with um, even digital records that are 10 years old are, whether they're around now or not, uh, 
it depends maybe they don't always last um so i think that's something and maybe we can talk about this a little bit more with everyone but i think having digital things and that i think it's the same for museums because they're dealing with digital artifacts as well um there's a lot more opportunities but i think there's a lot of risks maybe risks is a good word or maybe just things to be concerned about um that we're still figuring out what all of those issues are and the best ways to deal with them but um, it's definitely different I will say too, I mean, I know a lot of museums in the past year have been focused on collecting artifacts related to the pandemic and how we're going to tell the story of this past year. And uh, I'm sure a lot of places have been focusing on, you know, our digital records because that's how we've been communicating. That's, you know, the only way we were able to keep in touch with our friends and family over the past year. So I know um, a lot of our sites haven't collected a lot of digital um, records that I know of at least in the past year, but I'm sure that um, that they're out there and that they're, they're something that um, we're gonna have to deal with in the immediate future. Maybe shifting gears a little bit, unless Ian, you have something you'd like to add on digital records. I, so many museums have been producing, not just not just looking to preserve digital records, but have been producing digital exhibits and digital content that 50, 60 years from now will be a primary source in their own right. Uh, but not to go down that tangent, uh, do you think the digital content will continue? Is this something that members of the public, patrons, uh, did they like it? Do they want it moving forward? Or are people just itching to get back to gallery openings? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, one of the really interesting things that happened during the pandemic is that our audience grew geographically. Um, a lot of our sites um, were used to getting people, you know, from Pennsylvania or, you know, on like, you know, a road trip. Um, but then once we shifted a lot of our programming online, we were getting participants from the West Coast. We were getting participants from other countries. And so that has really um, widened our scope. And I think that's something that we want to continue. Obviously, the, the wider the audience, the better. Um, so I think that there might be some sort of hybrid situation where if we can um, put some of our programming online or I know there's been talk of... Um, like live streaming, like speaker series and things like that. So that that way we can get people who aren't geographically close um, access to to our resources. I, I would just say, um, you know, there, there's so there's so much uh, from the archival side from as a user of archival materials, there's there's so much that's been opened up as I was talking about earlier. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges has been uh, on occasion, having too much information and needing, you know, the, the, one of the special things about the archive is you can leaf through papers quite at, a, at whatever speed works for your method. Um, and it's much, much harder to leaf through 800 page Adobe files that um, that might not be text optima, you know, like, or uh, type re recognizable that uh, might take forever to load um, or Google books that might be impartial, uh, impartially available, or, um, you know, all sorts, but, or, or, or records that you can't flip between, um, between sections easily. Um, there, there's just, there's a kind of tactile quality to kind of, I think, efficient and effective research based in kind of archival and written materials. Um, and so that's one thing, I know the question was really about museums, but um, this strikes me as something for my own method. And I think I, I think probably for many historians and users of archival materials, this is uh, a challenge uh, that we, um, I personally am looking forward to not having in, in the hopefully nearest future. Yeah, I, I, I like to print out every single digital record that I look at and just lay them out on the table. But I can't imagine that that is ecologically friendly <laughs> to do that. Is there an opportunity in history and library science? Uh, is the curriculum, is there an opportunity opening up with so much more happening digitally for digital humanities as a career trajectory? Not just 
not just for those with masters and PhDs, but is this an opportunity for undergraduates looking to work in history if they've got some of the digital skills? I don't know who would want to tackle that question. I certainly don't know the answer. Yeah, I mean, I think that on a, I think a lot of like li am I, um, masters in library and information science stuff, people have already started tackling a lot of that information uh, that that's part of their core requirements. I mean, that was one thing that going into figuring out what I wanted to do my master's in that I was like, I don't know if I can do all this tech stuff. And so I was like, maybe I shouldn't focus on the library science thing and went towards history. So I think maybe if we can even just rope some like librarians in in the discussion as well. I mean, they, I'm sure they can shed a lot of light and be a valuable resource to us as how they deal with some of these digital records. Yeah, and I, I know there's been a lot of really interesting work in digital humanities with archives and some digitized collections um, with some of like the data mining and things that they do with that. Uh, but I, I think when I was in grad school, there were a couple of kind of tech oriented classes that I had to take as a, a, a grad student in library science, but there weren't a lot. So I could really, I graduated before that was really a requirement. I know it's a lot more now today. Um, but I, I think at the very least, just for most archivists and curators and everybody today, you have to at least be able to know the language or else be able to communicate with IT folks or the, the more digitally minded people um, to at least know like what the programs are, what they do, like what can you do, what is not possible, because uh, you don't want to ask for things that just really aren't feasible. And then when something is wrong, you need to be able to know what the issue is, uh, maybe not how to fix it, but at least like what is the problem. Uh, and I deal with that a lot in the archives where we're, you know, even just little, little things, uh, but just one of the big things we're dealing with is how do we transfer records to the archives when record creators have them in all different formats and you know things some things are stored in the cloud other things it's a localized database and how do i extract the data from this proprietary database and get it to the archives in a separate file format in a way that we can preserve it but we can also provide good access to it down the road um, other people still say oh i've got like these old magnetic reel tapes from the 80s and can you do something we don't have the machine to work with them anymore um, so I, I think we're getting to the point where no matter if you're somebody who's interested in being in the history field, you can't get away from that digital component anymore. It's not like, oh, I can sit in the back and just work with the old stuff. I think it's it's part of the work now. Uh, it'll come in some shape or form, no matter what work you're doing and where you're doing it. Uh, so you can't really, can't really hide anymore, I think. Uh, and I think the pandemic has really just torn that open. Anybody who thought that that wasn't the case, I don't think you can deny that anymore. With the digital humanities and interfacing with IT, is there some labor that can't be uh, done with machine learning, like cursive handwriting in a in pidgin language, uh, in the different ways letters are written? Uh, is machine learning up to par to? turn some of that cursive into searchable text or is that is that way too far on the horizon is that a question outside of the scope of historians G given how hard i've found right it reading uh handwritten microfilmed uh letters to begin with uh i'm skeptical That's what I would hope. I would hope that bodes well for the profession that historian's skill can't be automated. And, and that's a good transition point to history as a profession. Uh, you know, it looks like undergraduate majors after a decades long decline are starting to stabilize, but tenure track jobs have not rebounded yet. And even a bunch of PhD programs suspended applications into or admission into PhDs in history through the pandemic, mostly the elite schools that don't depend on TAs for labor. Uh, what's, what's it going to take? And Ian, I might throw this question to you because I know you're involved in 
organizing at Rutgers and, and advocacy for higher ed generally, uh, what's it going to take to make sure that history and humanities are a sustainable profession for PhDs, masters in public history, and just undergraduates who love the field and want to work in the field? Absolutely. I think this is the most important fe question facing not just the history profession, but really all fields of uh, humanistic inquiry uh, and scholarship of any kind, um, whether you're in the classroom or in a museum or in an archive or, or doing any kind of work that is socially reproducing and materially reproducing our ability to do all that, uh, dining halls, um, uh, custodial staff, uh, everyone on the campuses of universities um, has been facing uh, decades and decades of public disinvestment and uh, eroding labor rights and um, uh, dis, you know, disincentives to, um, to expand this really critical work. And so I am fully of the opinion, uh, and I think from my experience organizing at Rutgers, I think it's a little more than an opinion. I think it's actually um, you know, borne out empirically that the only way that we can secure a future for our professions is by organizing as big as 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 large as large as possible coalitions of as many possible people who are all implicated in in the in in the future of this work. Um, and so to me, uh, and and what I've been really inspired and excited about during during COVID, um, as someone who's also doing a lot of organizing, is working through my union with um, a network of, of academic workers across this country called Scholars for New Deal for Higher Education, which is advocating for massive, not just reinvestment in higher education from the federal level, but also a kind of rethinking of, of how we um, prioritize and how we govern, uh, how we use higher education uh, in this country um, as a social good and as a, 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 public, a public good and a, and, a, and a universal social right. And so it's been really, um, that's been really gratifying. And I think we've actually made some, we've, ar we've ar already started to make progress. Um, we're putting de-adjunctification on the political stage. Uh, we got um, the Bernie Sanders College for All Act to be changed to include a provision that would not only require that institutions receiving federal support for higher education uh, move to 75% uh, tenure track and, and tenured workforces within five years, but also that those jobs go first and foremost to people who are currently adjunct contingent workers. Um, there are more there are more PhD historians now than there have ever been in history, and there are fewer and fewer tenure track jobs than than uh, you know proportionally than, than, than we've than we've ever had. Um, the the crisis is the number of historians. The crisis uh, and the crisis isn't isn't the amount of money flowing through our universities. But the crisis is how that money is 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 how those priorities are being used and who's making those decisions. So. Sorry for going on, getting on the soapbox about this, but uh, uh, this, this is fundamentally a question of power and politics. And are we as workers and we as professionals have to be able to maneuver through the, through the, um, the venues and the vehicles that we have, whether that's our unions, whether that's our professional associations, whether that's um, in, in even more casual ways with, with, your, with your coworkers to, um, to, to not just claw back what we lost, but actually to, to build something better than what we had before. To follow up on that, and this is a perfect venue to get on a soapbox because we are, this is a, the PHA aims to be a consortium of different professionals in, histor in history, not just the tenure track historian. And, and certainly we want to, as an organization, grow and make sure to serve that public historian capacity even better. But, Tenure track jobs, especially, and and the the academic freedom of tenure and those protections, to me, seem pretty critical to having candid scholarship. Uh, books, exhibits, the kind of work researchers do. How does that ripple out to other aspects of history when tenure is eroded? Uh, I'll throw that to that question to anyone who might want to tackle it, if you're comfortable, because we are erring on the, the more political side of the profession now. Well, I, as someone who's not a public employee, uh, in, in a strict sense, I, I, I wonder if I might start despite having also just talked. Um, uh, I think right now we're facing 
um, a political backlash in this country against uh, uh, the kind of bold and, and insurgent labor and social movements that have been revived and, 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 and built anew in the past few years. And I think, for example, one of the areas where we're seeing that ex most explode is controversy around uh, critical race theory um, and critical race scholarship, um, not just in the strict sense of the legal studies subfield of critical race theory, but um, but more generally, um, it's 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 an opening to attacks on his on scholars of and particular historians of uh, enslavement of of black history of of not of history that cuts against the grain of kind of normative uh, national scholarship. And there's, you know, that that didn't begin as an attack on, of course, historians, it began as an attack on, on a kind of journalistic project, but um, it's very quickly snowballed into um, state level legislative uh, efforts to uh, disempower scholars and disempower educators and museum workers and all sorts of people from uh, engaging in questions that are really hot in this country in this moment, um, that majorities of this country are interested in talking about and, and thinking about and, and kind of working on. I, th I think this is, um, you know, academic freedom in this moment is is pretty deeply tied up in in questions far bigger than the classroom. On the flip side, some institutions and museums have also been perpetrators of injustice. We know at the University of Pennsylvania, Penn Museum remains were found in the collection from victims of the move bombing when Philadelphia police bombed their own citizens. How do museums moving forward and, and universities affiliated and also co-conspirators, how, how do we grapple with some of the racist legacies of our own institutions and do better moving forward? My turn that. Yeah, I'll, um, I know right now that's been a large, a, a huge topic within the museum community. Um, there's this whole nothing about us without us type of mentality, which is like, a, I, like, I love that slogan. It's so great. And I think that that is something that we are shifting towards in the museum field, that how can we as museums remain relevant when we don't talk about the communities in which we live, in which we are positioned. Um, and so I think that there has been a large shift in towards um, shifting authority away from museums and the people who work in them who are majority, the majority of which are white and female and male. And so it's like, how can we um, involve our community members and get them to tell their own story and um, kind of shifting authority away from us to let them have the grounds in which to tell their story the best way, better than we might be able to. Yeah, and I'll just add real quickly, um, kind of going off of what Ian and also Rachel said, um, I think in the archives field where I've seen a definite shift, or maybe just I've become more aware of it. I mean, it's been around for a while, but community archiving. Um, so the thought that, you know, records and stories and the history of a community shouldn't necessarily just go to an established repository like the state archives or somebody else, but it should stay within the community um, and they can do the preservation and access and kind of um, that kind of work. Uh, and so we've been trying to get to know who in Pennsylvania is already doing that work and how we can support them better. Uh, so I think that's one area where we're seeing, you know, talking about the future of the history PhD and just all the act work and careers in general. Um, I think we're seeing that people don't have to be in kind of the established academy or institutional places in the past where it's like that was where you went if you had a history degree, like you're going to work in a university or in, in the state archives or PHMC or something. And now that's definitely not the case anymore. And that's, you know, all over the country. I think we're seeing sophisticated and really talented projects and work that are going on in all kinds of places. Um, just talking about contingent faculty, there's a great magazine called Contingent Magazine that publishes work by non-tenure track historians. And the work in there is absolutely brilliant. And it comes from park rangers and history high, high school history teachers and other folks who you know aren't those kind of your typical people who you would um, think of when we talk about historians and, and things like that. Um, so I think we're just seeing who is doing the kinds of work that we talk about when we talk about history, who is doing it, and where it's being done is shifting. 
Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's a different thing. And I think we need to, you know, be aware of that. Um, but I think it just opens up a lot of new opportunities. And I think it's, it's always for the best. Or I think it's, it's a really positive shift that we're seeing. On that note, talking the future of the field and where history will be practiced. Uh, I'll pose one question to everyone, but I want to remind our attendees, if you've got a question, please do drop it into the chat. Uh, and then we'll get to those after this last question. If there are no audience questions after this, we'll, we'll wrap up the webinar. But uh, what advice would each of you have for someone considering a history major or in a history major looking for life after graduation? What's, what's your one tip, trick, uh, thing you'd tell yourself when you were back in their shoes? Rachel, mind if we start with you? No, that's fine. Um, we get a lot of interns and I always tell them that, uh, you know, that their volunteer work is just as valuable as any paid position that you're going to get. You're going to get that that experience that you need. And, and I know I tried to tell them also to try to put your get get out of your own head and try and make something that you don't think you're going to like because you never know. And honestly, it might end up being something that you end up doing uh, long term more than what you thought you'd start out with. So don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself in one in one area. Ian, how about you as a, a PhD worker who teaches students? Um, only go to a fully funded program. And look very carefully at teaching requirements and whether or not there's a union and whether or not that union is strong. Thanks, Ian. And how about you, Tyler? All right, my, my point isn't quite as short and sweet as Ian's, but I had two things that came to mind. One is um, advocate for yourself or for you know the work that you're doing. Um, I, I feel like a lot of times in the historical profession, and I, I know the library field, they call it vocational all, where it's like the work that we're doing is so important that, you know, we take lower salaries or we take, you know, different working conditions that aren't ideal and things like that, just because the work and the service that we're doing of preserving and sharing history is just so important to our society. Um, but, you know, we still are doing work and we need to get compensated for that and, you know, and as is appropriate, but uh, so I just, just think advocating for yourself, whether that's for, you know, salary or working conditions, uh, or maybe that's as an institution, if, you know, wherever you're working, advocating for your budget or things like that. I know that comes into us with government where, uh, you know, we rely on the budget to do the work that we do and to have the resources that we have um, and other things like that. But I think a lot of times people outside of our field don't always understand the labor and the work that goes into what we do. Uh, I, I know a lot of times at the archives, because most researchers, they come into the reading room and that's all they see. But the state archives is, you know, that's only 5% of what's going on. There's so many people in the back and doing all these different things that you'll never see. Uh, but the archives couldn't run without them. Uh, so I think advocating for, for that uh, in whatever way you have to is something that's really important. And the other thing really quickly is just um, no matter where you work in history, just keep an eye out for people outside of your field or your discipline and learn from them. Um, I've learned a lot from archivists who work in very different kinds of institutions that are not government institutions like mine, uh, and just also other folks, uh, museum professionals, people like Rachel, you know, I, especially in the last year where I've got to co-present with Rachel on a couple of things, I've learned a lot from her that has been really useful. Um, academic historians, record managers, you name it, um, take the best things that other people are doing in other fields and then see how you can apply it to what you're doing, uh, and it'll, it'll be for the best, so those are my my two pieces of advice I wish that I had done earlier on. On that note, I wanna thank all of our panelists, Rachel, Tyler, and Ian for their labor this evening uh, as a volunteer organization, not as not compensated as well as it could be. And that's a question we grapple with the PHA leadership and it's gonna be an ongoing conversation with our group, with our different professional organizations is how we also serve our profession. I loved your point, Tyler, about how with vocation, we shouldn't concede that it is also labor. Uh, and so 
I want to thank everyone on this panel for your time and your expertise tonight. I want to thank the Pennsylvania Historical Association for hosting this series and letting us talk candidly about our profession and experiences working over the past year and also looking ahead. Uh, we don't have any audience questions, but I will, before this is over, drop my email into the chat or put it out on the website to get in touch. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was wonderful.